Mr. Weber is a leading health care policy consultant. His expertise lies in custom designing health plans which significantly reduce costs to employers and employees and reduce Obamacare compliance costs. Uh, he and a group of private investors founded Medibid, which allows patients to shop for medical care across state lines and international borders with full transparency. So please help me welcome Ralph Weber. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's, it's very, very good to be here. Uh, I, I want to thank Keith and Charlie and Jay for putting on this meeting. Very much needed. It's great to bring employers, employees, and doctors all together. And it's great to hear all, all of the different ideas and all of the people that are thinking the same way. So I'm very happy to be here. The, um, the, the name of my discussion for today in the, in, in the program says, Changing the Way We Buy Health Care. The title here says Medical Care. So I wanted to, to start by talking a little bit about that. Um, can we go ahead and move to the next slide? <clears throat> what is the product? What is the product that we really are buying? For those of us in the room that are old enough to have turned on a high beam with their left foot, we remember the day when the product was medical care. You went to your doctor, sometimes you paid with chickens or with eggs. The doctor treated you. If you were hurt, if you were injured, if you were sick, you got treatment. It was medical care. Medical care is a service. It's very hard to leverage a service. Now, health care is a financial product. It's a financial instrument. It's no longer a service, and it can be highly leveraged. 1929, Blue Cross was formed by the hospital association to make sure that hospitals got paid better and to fill the beds. 1939, Blue Shield was started to pay the doctors. 1973, of course, the HMO Act, and, and then in 2010, uh, the ACA doubled down on all of that. So let's think about some financial instruments that have had adverse effects. Subprime mortgage crisis, Lehman Brothers, Goldman Sachs, they created bubbles. This financial product that, that Adam was referring to, the, really the BUCA one, the fully insured health plan, is a product which is creating a bubble through the PPO networks, through the lack of transparency. And it's a product which increases utilization and it increases costs. We can't control the cost of medical care if it's being driven by the product called health care. It's like a tiny little wedge pushing a big boulder. And it's increasing, and, and, and of course we have all the, these con convoluted charge master allowable and paid prices. We have all these discounts and, and things like that. Um, there's one word. There's one word that, that I'm looking for to define the product called healthcare. If anybody can get that word, you'll get an autographed copy of my book. Scam. <laughs> Good, but not what I was looking for. Not bad. One word. Who, who, who can think of the one word that defines the product? Go ahead, yell it out. Irrational. Irra well, yeah. That, that, descri that's a, that describes the product. One word. Jay? Any, anybody? What's the product we're buying? What do we buy when we buy health care? What do we buy? Access, you're getting close. You're getting close. They, they, they say it's access, but... You're buying good or service. Yeah, good or service. Co that's it. Where, where, who said coverage? There you go. I'll, I'll give it. Coverage. The product is coverage. Product is not treatment. It's not care. It's coverage. You're buying coverage. Originally being from Canada, where 96% of the people have coverage, but most people lack access, okay? Buying coverage is not gonna get you care. Let, let's go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, the way we buy it now, how do we buy you know, this healthcare product now? I mean, I'm not talking about the TPA specially designed products. I'm talking you know, the, the fully insured BUCA type products, okay? We select 
a health plan. We pick a deductible, we pick a, a co-insurance, co-pays, premium, stuff like that. If we bought cars this way, we'd go out shopping for a car loan. we get the car loan, we'd agree on the terms, and we'd go to a car dealer and, and, and we'd say, uh, I've got this loan, what does this entitle me to? Okay? And the dealer would say, well, you know, the white Kia in spot P28. So we're buying an entitlement the way we buy health care now. We're buying a private entitlement. Again, it's designed to drive up the cost and utilization. The discounts, the artificial discounts, they're, they're really interesting. I was, a few years ago, I was negotiating a contract for a client, 5,000 employee group, it was a county, and they said one of the criteria which we will award this on is the amount of discount. So I went to the local hospital trying to negotiate a direct contract. And I said, I've got a group of 5,000 employees. I'd like to direct contract. What are your average discounts? And they said, well, you know, between 42 and, and 54. I said, oh, okay. Um, wh what are your billed rates? Well, they're about 400% of Medicare. Okay, 400 less, but okay, it's two, okay. Can I get a better discount if, if I have a direct contract? They said, oh, sure, sure, no problem. And I said, well, what kind of discount could I get? And they said, what do you want? And I said, well, how about 75%? Sure, yeah, no problem. So I'm saying, okay, I got this one. And they said, now we're going to have to charge 800% of Medicare. <laughs> okay. So the discounts are artificial. The, you know, the discounts are artificial. artificial. Artificial charge master, artificial discount, artificial allowable. You know, where's it all leading to? And it's because of the definition of the product. The... Um, Go ahead and move to the next slide. The medical care has really become a byproduct. It's become a, a, almost an inconvenient byproduct. And of course, the Bukas want the medical care to be more expensive and used more because they're making a little percent on every procedure. Not even to mention about the, the leakage in the PPOs. Initially, as I said, Blue Cross and Blue Shield were invented to pay the hospitals and to, the, to pay the doctors. But since then, they have become entities to pay themselves and the metocrats, the, the millions of metocrats in this country that just make things more complex. They don't add value. They don't treat people. All of the, the burdensome admin that the administrators have, that the physician's offices have, that the insurance companies have, that Medicare Medicaid has. I wanted to... Uh, Talk a little bit about the, the product as redefined. And the product is really, it's medical care. S Samaritan Ministries is, Jed, Jed was out, okay, Jed. Samaritan Ministries, when their members go for care, they go for medical care. And if you look at their monthly shares, they've made it very, very affordable because they look for the product called medical care. With some of these Buka health plans, some of the reverse incentives that drive up cost, like the an annual cliff deductible, I was just talking at the Physician-Owned Hospital Association day before yesterday in Phoenix, and I was talking about direct contracting. And I said, the one thing that you have to do before you direct contract is you want to look at the provisions of the plan. You want to look at the plan document. You want to look at the ASA. You want to look at the plan design. As we see these deductibles increase, 3,500, 5,000, 6,000, 6,350, as we see them increase, and next year when we see industries that traditionally haven't been covered, low-wage industries, people earning $7.50 an hour with a $6,000 deductible, their accounts receivable are going to be with the employee, not the plan. So I said, okay, if you negotiate a direct contract and you've got this huge annual cliff deductible, you're going to have AR. So you have to think about the price that you offer. The other thing that the annual cliff deductible does, it's September. My knee is getting really sore, you know. And, well, I, I, you know, I haven't met my deductible yet, but my wife's having a baby in March. So I'm just going to wait until January because I'm going to go through my deductible next year. By then, a knee scope has become a full knee replacement. So it's escalated, and it's, it's designed to do that. Also, once you use your annual deductible, you're all in. Once you're all in, you go all out. 
on medical care. So the BUCA plans are designed to increase costs. And that's why they have increased the cost of, of care. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and skip past the next two. Pricing. So how do we price medical care? Well, there's many, there's many different ways. There's a lot of leaders in this room that are, that are really you know, leading the charge on pricing medical care. But really, ultimately, there are a couple of different ways, a couple of main categories, static and dynamic. The way we used to buy hotel rooms or seats on airlines which is very complex. When you think about air travel, there are tens of thousands of destinations, hundreds of thousands of planes, millions of passengers. So how do you sell that before Travelocity? They had a rack rate, and then they had a few simple rules. Is the passenger under 12 or over 65? Are they booking 21 days in advance? Are they staying a Saturday night? Those were the kind of rules that each one gave a discount off of the rack rate. That's how we bought air travel. Travelocity and Expedia and Hotels.com, when you go online, the rates are dynamic. They're changing because they're based on occupancy rate, actually more specifically vacancy rate. Okay? If, if you've got a, a hotel that has 80% of the rooms empty, you're going to get a better deal than one that has 5% of the rooms empty. Okay? It's, based on, it's based on vacancy rate. Why can't medical care be priced that way? Why not? It's not as complex as the Bukas want us to think. It really isn't. We can be transparent. And I'm sure Keith's prices aren't the same all the time. They change from time to time. So we can have this. Now, uh, let's go ahead and queue up film number one, where I talk about transparency. Did you know that the price of any given medical procedure can vary across town, across the state, by huge amounts. For example, colonoscopy. You can get a colonoscopy for $400. You can get a colonoscopy for about $6,500. And there is no difference, virtually no difference. 20 times difference in price, but no difference in the tools, in the training of the surgeon. No difference, but a huge difference in price. As a matter of fact, even within an insurance PPO network, it can vary by 10 times. There's this huge variance, but with no transparency. There's a lot of things about healthcare that people don't know. We're finding these things out, we're asking some questions, we're doing the work, and we're gonna keep bringing these to you, because people have a right to know. Back 20, 30 years ago, you used to pay your doctor in chickens. He would tell you how much medical care costs. Have you ever wondered why you can't see the cost of medical care anymore? Reminds me of a story I once heard. I'm not sure if it's true, but it makes a lot of sense. Two insurance executives, probably about 25 years ago, were having a meal in a restaurant. The first guy looked at the menu and he says, hey, there's no prices here, what's going on? The second guy says, well, you know what they say, if they don't publish the prices, you probably can't afford it. The first guy said, you know, that just gave me a brilliant idea. This is fabulous, you're gonna love this. How about if we hide the prices of medical care from patients, don't let them see it. They're gonna think it's so expensive that they can't afford it and they're gonna to have to buy insurance. It's gonna be a great way to sell insurance. What do you think? Maybe that's how we lost transparency. So for two generations now, since 73, we have been diseducated about the true costs, okay? We, we, we've been told, no, you can't afford it. We're learning, I mean, most of the people in this room, I think, understand that, yes, you can. And, and we need to re-educate the public. Some of the recent interviews that I've had were, the one was with publisher of Dell Magazine, and I realized suddenly that the millennials are the ones that are gonna drive the change because they're not going to accept the status quo. Because they were born with a tablet, with an iPhone. 
They can research. They're, they're not going to buy this lack of transparency. So the millennials are going to drive the change. And through up trickle up pressures, they'll drive the rest of it. So the millennials, I think, are going to be a big key. Um, let's go ahead and move to the next one. The way Medibid works is really simple. It works with a self-funded health plan. Whether you have Medibid as a replacement for a network, an enhancement to a network, a, a first tier to a three-tiered plan, or use it on a reference-based price, the employee logs on to Medibid, and if you have a reference-based price that, that has a cap or a reward point, they're going to see that number. They're going to see this is your either reward point or your cap for your procedure. And then they press a button that says create medical request. They make a medical request. Let's say it's for a knee replacement as an example. It gets sent to every orthopedic surgeon registered on Medibid across the country and overseas. And we have doctors in 10 countries. The doctors reply with a bid. Here's how much it's going to cost. Here's what's included. The employee will look at the doctor profile. They'll look at the call quality. They'll look at the outcomes. And they'll make their choice. And they say, I accept. And then the auto reply comes back. When would you like to make your appointment? One of our uh, patients that was interviewed on the Today Show about 11 months ago, Perry Hunt, um, needed a, a total hip replacement. He had needed it for a couple of years. This was, you know, back during, you know, a few years ago in California. He was really busy, and he owned a small construction company. He was told a THA had a six-month recovery time. He couldn't take six months off, so he put it off. He put it off. He put it off. Finally, he couldn't take the pain anymore, and he said, "Okay, I'm going to get this done." So he was approved by Blue Cross. He was approved for surgery, and then the hospital called him five days before the surgery. And they said, you know, listen, they're not going to cover it. For some reason, they're not going to cover it now. But if you pay right now, we're going to give you a 30% discount. So if you pay cash, we can, we can still see you on Tuesday. So Perry said, well, I mean, how much is that? Like after 30% off, how much is it? $70,000. And he said, sorry, I don't have $70,000 plus six months to take off. So he found Medibid. He made a request. Within a day, he got a bid from India for $7,500. And they got a couple from California for $14,000, got one from Houston for $15,000, Phoenix for $12,000, San Antonio for $21,000. He accepted the highest bid for $21,000 because the surgeon said, I'm not going to be the lowest bid, but I perform a quality service and I perform a minimally invasive procedure with a quicker recovery time. And here's how I do it. And he explained posted all his outcomes. So the patient accepted that bid. Some of the critics that, that, that follow Medibid, and Keith mentioned Marty McCary earlier, there's Marty McCary and there's Art Kaplan. They keep saying, no, 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 in healthcare you have to pay more. You have to pay more to get more. I mean, who's going who's gonna to go doctor shopping for the cheapest doctor? When I go to Hotels.com, I'm not always looking for the Motel 6. I'm not looking for the cheapest. I'm looking for the value. For this patient, there was value in paying more money to get a quick recovery time. He was back on the job in two weeks, climbing ladders, lugging plywood. Okay? That was his value proposition. So value-based healthcare, looking for the doctor you want, looking for the procedure you want, is very important. Let's, uh, okay. Some of, the, um, some of the people that have used us, one was a Samaritan Ministries member in Chicago, needed a colonoscopy. The best price he could find shopping around, $3,500. He flew to Oregon for a colonoscopy. <laughs> Chicago to Oregon, for colon he got it for $800. Even after he paid his hotel and his room and his car rental, he still saved $2,000. We had a patient in Miami, needed a lumbar discectomy. Went to New York, paid fourteen thousand four hundred. Another one that we had needed a uh, rotator cuff repair. He'd waited for years and years because he couldn't afford it. He chopped around for price. He was in Seattle, went to Virginia, 
for rotator cuff. So people are traveling. They are traveling and they are looking at the quality. They're looking not just at the price, but also at the quality. Another thing that people use us for is procedures that aren't available in the US, like HIFU for prostate cancer, hyperthermia for breast cancer, stem cell therapy for non-invasive knee replacements. People want these things, and they go online to find them. They want the value that it brings. Now, we had a first last week. We had a patient accept a bid. The patient is in Pennsylvania. He is traveling to Canada for hernia repair. <laughs> Imagine that. We're sending Americans to Canada now. <laughs> okay. So I, I found it kind of funny, and NBC News wants to do a story on it. I'm not sure if, <laughs> how they'll spin it, but... But it's, it's a market. It's a market. It's growing. And it's something that, that only online technology can enable. People can search for the procedure they want. They can search for the surgeon they want. They can, they can look for the quality. Let's, uh, whoops, let's move ahead here. I jumped ahead a little bit. Okay, one more. Okay. Um, get back to that a second. When I was, um, I was up in uh, Nashville probably about five months ago, and I was driving towards Knoxville. And it's kind of a mountainous road. I went around the corner, and a car was coming the other way, speeding, swerving back and forth. And the driver leaned out the window, and he yelled, Pig! And so I yelled some things back, which I won't repeat. He almost cut me off. And then as I turned the corner, go ahead and move to the next slide, what did I see in the middle of a road? A pig! So the signals he was giving me wasn't an insult, it was a warning. Okay? So we have to change the paradigm. We have to listen to the signals. We have to hear the warnings. The PPO networks, I feel, are in decline. We can't afford them anymore. People are starting to see this. They're starting to demand something better. They're starting to demand change. And, and the change is coming. We're going to see growth. Well, next year, of course, when, when you know, all these industries I talked about are going to have to provide coverage, we're going to see a lot of changes because a lot of people can't afford it. We're going to see narrow networks. We're already seeing them. Reference-based pricing. We're going to see medical tourism. All these kinds of things, there's, there's a market for it. And there's going to be a lot of, there has been a lot of change in innovation. This is going to, going to continue. Um, let's, uh, let's go ahead and show the Fox business video. This was an interview I did about uh, 10 months ago. Think about this. If you needed surgery, would you bid out the procedure to doctors and hospitals and other places in the country, people you had never met, just to save money? It's happening more and more because even when they say it's not, it's always about money. Sure, we all love going online to find the best deal, but usually you're talking about a hotel room, a flight, a television. Would you feel comfortable accepting an online bid for a hip replacement from a doctor you have never met? It is the newest wave in comparison shopping, and the website MetaBid has made it a reality, giving people the chance to evaluate offers from doctors across the country and then travel to get the care of their choice. Here to discuss how it all works is MetaBid's president, Ralph Weber. Ralph, what's the experience? I go online, what happens? Well, um, you go online and you make a request. Now, it depends if you work for an employer that uses MediBid to source care or if you're just an individual. Um, so you make a request and you can put in your parameters, a few health questions, you know, your height, your weight, any medication allergies. Um, you can put in how far you're willing to travel, if, if at all. 
um, and then you request a bid. You can review all the doctor's profiles so you see where they, where they went to medical school, what their training was, what their experience is, how many of these procedures they do every year. So you really get to see a lot about the quality of the doctor hmm. be, you know, as you make the request. Wow. Which, you know, with, with traditional insurance, I mean, you, all you know is in-network or out-of-network. Yeah, yeah, you really don't know that much. I mean, although you are able to ask people in your community generally, especially if your community is smaller, then everybody sort of knows everybody. I have a lot of questions right. about all that. Okay, so if I'm an individual, uh, uh -huh. do I have to join and pay a fee in order to be able to go and look if my employer is not a member? Yeah, if your employer's not a member, you can pay $25 just to make one request or join for $4.95 per month. Mm -hmm. uh, and then $4.95 per month is, is a one-year commitment. And then you can go on anytime you like and, and make requests. So, you know, the biggest question I'm sure that everyone out in the audience has is what kind of doctors do you have on the network? I mean, does it include everyone? Is it just a small group? I mean, what percentage would you say of the doctors in America are available on your website? Well, not a, not a huge percentage. We, we look for doctors that are not the mainstream big box type of providers. Uh, doctors prefer getting cash at the time of care. The traditional insurance model where they, they will, you know, charge one price that's called the charge master and then the carrier reprices it to the allowable uh, and then they're paid a portion of that. It sometimes takes 120 days or so for them to get their money. So the doctors like getting paid at the time that the care, and also they get to set their own prices. Yeah. With traditional insurance, they're told what they're going to be paid, and that's it. No, that's interesting. They get to set their own price and see what the market will bear. Uh, a right. lot of our viewers tweeted in and said, you know, it's very normal for people to travel to Sloan Kettering or to travel to MD Anderson for cancer treatment. Right. Um, so they're familiar with the idea of traveling for big names. Do you have big names like that on your site? Yes, as a matter of fact, we do. Baylor in Houston, uh, MD Anderson uh, is, is participating on a very small level. Yeah. Uh, we have talked to Curl and Job in Los Angeles. Uh, they they kind of were looking at it. They haven't made a final evaluation. Yeah. So absolutely, we do have, and, and over, we have overseas facilities too, like Boomerangrad in Bangkok. Well, uh, let me ask you about how some of the financials work. Okay, so say I get to, the doctor looks great online, you know, I look at mm -hmm. his, for whatever you can tell. I mean, I have the same problem when I'm kind of on my own yeah. health network and you're looking and you see their education, but until you go see them, you don't really know them. So say you get out there and you meet them or you see the hospital and you don't feel good about it. What happens then? Do you lose the travel money? How do the financials work? Okay, well, I mean, if you've paid for your own fl uh, flight, then yeah, yeah, I mean, you've, you've had sort of a two-day vacation, I guess, or, or whatever. Uh, I mean, it's not much different than if you looked in the yellow pages and went to MD, MD Anderson or the local, you know, corner hospital either way. I mean, if you get there, you don't uh, like the physician for whatever reason. Now, r keep in mind, you've had a lot of transactions before you get to there. A lot of the doctors, when they respond to a bid, they'll say, okay, you know, before, before we go through this, maybe we should have a phone call or talk on Skype or something like that. Yeah. So usually by the time you, you get there, you've, you've actually kind of met the person sort of online. And how does insurance play into this? Because in a couple of the articles that I was reading about this, they were saying that in some cases, your insurance company will pay for you to, to fly to an another place if it is significantly cheaper for them. How do you get your insurance company involved in shopping for prices? Well, uh, a lot of people use private third-party administrators where they have more flexibility. And it has to be right in the plan document where, where it will allow. Some of the big carriers won't actually allow you to negotiate a better price without considering it, it out of network, which means you pay more of a mm. deductible. So you have to make sure that your plan is set up uh, to, to wrap around this kind of travel arrangement. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're getting a, a knee replacement for 21000 versus seventy, dollars uh, it, it would be foolish for the, the carrier not to cover. So it's with self-funded employers where, where they can do this. And What's they can save... Yeah, I'm what's sorry, the go. most what's the most common type of surgery that people are traveling for? What do you see the most? Because I imagine it is an emergency surgery where people are price comparing. No, that that that's true. Uh, our app isn't quite fast enough to work in the in the ambulance. Um, a lot of people are using knee, knee replacement, hip replacement, colonoscopies. Uh, those are probably some of our more common uh, rotator cuff repair. We're getting a, a lot of requests for cosmetic. Uh, procedures, but I think orthopedic uh, would be the most common surgery because they're, they're yeah. mostly pre-planned.
Yeah. No, it's a very interesting model because, of course, we're going through these dramatic changes in healthcare. People are trying to figure out, you know, as they're forced to bear more the burden of cost, how they can make it cheaper for themselves. Here in New York, a lot of, you know, doctors have stopped taking insurance altogether and they've gone to all cash because the system is so hard to deal with. So an application yeah. like yours, I can see it gaining a lot of popularity as people, you know, realize that they're really out there on their own trying to fend for themselves. Um, it, Ralph it, Weber, great stuff. Thank you so much. Very it, interesting. And, and it's it's not go just ahead. about price, though, Melissa. It's yeah. not just about price. I mean, when you go to Hotels.com, you don't look for the Motel 6. It's about access, sometimes crossing a state line. A different medical board has different regulations which drastically can increase or decrease the cost. So it's about access and choice and getting the doctor that you want rather than the one that covers you. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I'm glad you added that. Ralph, I think it's the wave of the future. Thank you so much for coming great. on. Thank you, Melissa. Up next, it won't be long before we are all driving iCars. Okay, so <laughs> that ambulance thing, I just, <laughs> that was one of my favorites. But the, redefining the product is the starting point. A lot of us in this room have done that, and we need to keep doing that. We need to emphasize what the product is, and then TPAs such as Kempton and Trust can design products to wrap around that product. Okay, and products that don't increase utilization, that take advantage of transparency and competition. I'm seeing some really hopeful things on the legislative front. A few states have written some bills. West Virginia wrote a bill a couple of years ago. It hasn't passed yet. It's been reintroduced, but it would allow their state employees to utilize medical tourism. And if they do, their travel's covered and deductibles are waived, et cetera. Okay. That, that's an interesting bill. The state of Florida wrote a bill that said that their state employees can use a medical bidding service and bundled case, case rates and bypass the Blue Cross network. So on the legislative front, you know, even some of the states, even some of the governments are starting to realize it. So, so that's really hopeful to me. Employers. Employers are driving the change. They're demanding answers, answers that were previously unavailable. And I hope we can bring a lot of employers into this organization and educate them and bring them up to speed. As we redefine the product and create solutions to work around it, we're going to see sort of a tidal wave of change. We're going to see this escalate. As we see people traveling, like I said, for colonoscopy from Chicago to Oregon, they're just saying, no, I'm, I'm just not going to take this anymore. Just like, like the old movie network. I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. That's what we need to do. We need to say that. So we've got, uh, oh, good. Five more. Okay, yeah. We'll just uh, have a few questions for about five minutes if anybody has any questions. I've just got a I've just got a comment, Ralph. When we had our web design team make our website and there are others in this room, did you use our guys? I wish I did, but I didn't. <laughs> I know Dr. Bill Grant in at the Monticello yep. Surgery Center in Virginia used our website guys, but I had one condition that I could change the price prices from my iPhone. Oh yeah. Because I said, eventually this will take off. I'll have competitors, and I need to be able to respond and do it on the fly. Right. And I've done that. I mean, I've done that on my iPhone. And um, the other, the only other point I wanted to make, because um, your comment about dynamic and static pricing is, it, it's going to become more dynamic as more people enter this space. That's uh, for sure. It's not real dynamic right now. But right. I have changed our prices in the last five years, uh -huh. and in every case, I've lowered them in the last five years, except for some mathematical errors I made in the beginning when I had to adjust those. <laughs> but um, there are only about six of those. Um, we have 192 procedures, I think, online now, and more probably in the next two weeks. Great. Uh, but you're, I compliment you particularly for the making the distinction between dynamic and static pricing because this is going to look really really exciting as more people enter the space so prices will just be changing yeah, i thought if 
right now is our slow time at the surgery center of Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a, it's kind of a downtime and Steve and I've joked about putting up a sign, you know, is you know, bilateral mirror got to me with tubes, you know, half off or, <laughs> and actually show the price. Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, th- thank you, Keith. It's show the price. Yeah. And, 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 that, and that's the power of competition. It's the power, as competition increases, as you said, it's going to get more dynamic all the time. So, absolutely, thank you. Thank you for making that comment. Any other questions? Back here. Mine's actually more of a comment than a question. I I like the part of your talk that touches on the patient's value position. You know, the, the patient's not necessarily choosing the lowest price because they value certain things. Exactly. And I think this touches on what we talked about in the last session about quality. One of the problems with quality metrics is that you're trying to objectify everything. You're trying to quantify it into digital features and value and quality have a subjective portion. Different people value different things and different people... Right see quality in different things. You know, as a physician, we're trained to document our clinical encounters with something called a SOAP note. It's subjective, objective, assessment, and plan. And you ask any physician in the room, the vast majority of the decision-making comes from the subjective portion of the encounter. You talk to a patient for long enough, and they will tell you what is wrong with them. You don't need all those tests. They help. You can confirm your diagnosis with that, but the patient will tell you what is wrong with them if you talk to them. And that's the problem with quality metrics is you're putting everything into the objective box right. and you have eliminated the subjective portion of it. Quality is a, a satisfied patient. Quality is someone leaving your facility and going and telling their neighbor they did a good job. Right. And you can't put that in a number. Exactly, exactly. Thank you. One, one point I wanted to make, I'm asked a lot by the media, what if there are complications? And one patient that we sent to the Surgery Center of Oklahoma wasn't what they said they were. Now, our terms and conditions allow for, you know, would have allowed Keith to say, hey, listen, something else has come up. You know, I wasn't expecting this, so it's going to be a little bit more. But but Keith said, you know what? I make money on some. I lose money on a couple. I'm going to take care of it. You know, it's taken care of. So the way Keith sets his prices allow for that. Okay, so that that's an important thing. Also, in regards to quality, we thought about getting together with like a Leapfrog or Health Grades, but what I find is that they have more negative review. You know, the, the happy people they don't they don't go and post the reviews. You know, so it's sort of skewed. You know, we do inter well not interview, but we survey every patient that completes a procedure through Medibid, and we ask them five simple questions on a, on a scale of one to five. What was the bedside manner? Professionalism of staff? Was the outcome what you expected? You know, just those really simple questions, and we categorize them. And if there are ever really, really low ones, we'll act on it right away, okay? But we do monitor that going forward. We just haven't, you know, I mean, I agree with you. We haven't figured out the perfect way to, to post it. We have time for just one more. Yeah. Ralph, I wanted to put this to you and anybody in the room that might have experience with it. One of the problems we run into is is dealing with in-network patients, those that still have third-party contracts, and how do you deal with cash or, or a discounted services that's below, um, you know, what your um, uh, in-network... Um, contract might give you and, and one thing that some of the folks in my area have come up with is they they submit the claim as paid in full in other words if if they're going to get um you know 750 in 2 months right. for a procedure or or 500 today they take the 500 even the patients in network they take the 500 they submit the pl- uh, claim paid in full and therefore they really haven't violated their agreement. So what, what is your take on that? Well, if you are dealing with a cash patient, then just don't code it. Don't put a CPT in. Maybe if it's a bundled case rate, maybe it's a global rate. 
uh, because then you're not violating the PPL contract. You can say, that, you know, I mean, this this wasn't a 66070. This was a bundle. It was a few different things. I, I bundled this. Now, if it if you have to, you know, do the CPT codes, then you know it's a little bit kind of touchier. But by bundling, you know, you can you can sometimes get around that. But maybe I'll maybe there's somebody else that has a Ed. I think it was to keep so the folks can keep track of their deductible and kind of keep, keep credit for. I don't know if that was the driver why they coded it, but that's right. one of the ways around it. Ed, Ed, you want yeah. to make a comment? I, I, you know, a lot of people have automobile insurance. Hopefully, mostly everybody in this room. But if you ding my car door, you may choose not to use that insurance. And I've experienced, I, I had to go through the detailed details, but I saved 65% off of the PPO discounted price. The numbers were 11,300 billed, 7,700 um, after the PPO discount, cash price 2,700 all inclusive for replacement of a right lens for a cataract. And it was an interesting discussion because they had verified benefits and we had the first health network. And I just said, do we have a cash price? And they said, but you have insurance. I said, I, have, I know I have insurance, but I pay for it. It's mine and I choose not to use it. Do you have a cash price? And they said, yes, we do. And I took advantage of the cash price because I looked at the differential. So I would challenge any PPO contract all right, in a court of law, it says, wait a second, I'm paying the PPO through my insurance to get a discount, but I choose not to use it. I think that you know, I think the concern was on the physician side, whether they were violating the PPO never knows about it. Right, with, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Mr. Ralph Weber. Sure. Thank you.